Thank you, Vardhaman. Uh, thank you for that great uh, subspeciality day of refractive surgery. Now we come to a very important session, which is the AIOS uh, Endowment Awards. And uh, these are uh, named on uh, the luminaries in Indian ophthalmology and will be given by eminent and very illustrious uh, uh, speakers of the All India Ophthalmological Society. Can I have uh, the connection, please? So this year we have uh, five uh, AIOS Endowment Award, uh, Dr. L.P. Agarwal Endowment Lecture, which is given to doc uh, conferred on Dr. Mahipal, Mahipal Sachdev, Dr. P. Namparo Malswami Endowment Lecture, Dr. Lalit Verma, Dr. Gulapali N. Rao Endowment Lecture will be given by Dr. Prajana Venkatesh, Dr. Daljeet Singh Endowment Lecture will be given by Dr. T. P. Lane, and Dr. S. S. Badrinath Endowment Lecture will be given by Dr. Guru Prasad Ayalchit. Uh, we have uh, with us the, uh, the panel and the dais, and uh, we would begin. Uh, we would begin with the first lecture, which is uh, Dr. Gulapalli N. Rao Endowment Lecture. I think Dr. Gulapalli Nageshwar Rao does not need any introduction uh, to this August uh, audience. Uh, the chairman of Academia Ophthalmologica Internationalis and the founder of the L.V. Prasad Eye Institute uh, that is Hyderabad, which is now mushroomed almost all over India. And uh, indeed, we are honored to have you her here, sir. Uh, and uh, I would request uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Prajna Venkatesh uh, to g uh, give this lecture. Uh, Dr. Prajna, again, um, uh, everybody knows in the field of cornea has um, won accolades uh, for his uh, research uh, and his work. He's the academic director of Arvind Eye Care System. He oversees the residency program um, in Arvind Eye Care uh, uh, Hospitals, uh, manages the training program, has numerous peer-reviewed publications in leading international and national journals, and uh, also the chief editor for Payments, Principle, and Practice of Ophthalmology, the second edition that uh, compiles the contributions of more than 300 contributors He's also the editor-in-chief chief of DigiNerve and has figured in the top 2% of the scientists in the field of ophthalmology, uh, selected by the Stanford University. And he's going to be talking about advances in diagnosis of infectious keratitis. So Dr. Prajna. Can I have my slides, please? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Namrata and uh, the AOS uh, for uh, giving me this endowment award. Uh, I would like, I'm especially thankful that it is named, uh, I'm, I'm giving this talk, uh, which is named after Dr. G. N. Rao, who has seen me from my school days and uh, it, it is indeed an, uh, a great honor for me to be speaking uh, in this talk. So I'm not able to see anything here. Should I use that podium? Thank you very much. Just, there's no conflict of interest in this specific presentation. At the outset, I would like to pay my respects to a visionary par excellence, a person who brought research into ophthalmology in our country, a great institution builder, and a dynamic leader who exudes professionalism. As I mentioned, Dr. Rao knows me from my school days, if not my college days. And I would like to personally 
uh, acknowledge a few of the personal instances. Whenever Dr. G. N. Rao is around, I'm very, very careful with how I dress. At least three or four times in my career in the American meetings, he used to come and adjust my tie. And that is big, and uh, that has still not caught up with me, and so I decided not to wear a tie today. I knew that sir would be uh, in the podium. The second thing he always tells me, don't use the word sir, and I'm not able to uh, get away from that. I continue to use it. But jokes apart, when I first finished my residency, and I was actually immediately following my residency, I got an NIH project, which was involving 3,400 patients. I did not know the nuances of randomization and all that other stuff. And there was an international DSMC uh, group, which was actually set up. And Dr. Rao was a member in that. And he hand-held me in my earlier career, earliest career of uh, uh, entry into research into ophthalmology. Thank you very much, sir, for what you have done for me personally and also mentored me professionally. So these are my, uh, I've been interested in infectious keratitis uh, for quite some time now, and this has been our research contributions in the field of infectious keratitis uh, in the past 30 years focused very specifically on infectious keratitis and all aspects provided with infectious keratitis. And this is the basic research stuff also where we have contributed in this field, making us the single largest contributor in this field of infectious keratitis globally. Today, actually, I thought I will just share two of my papers, one which was published in AJO 2020, and the other very fresh off the press in December 2023 in JAMA Ophthalmology as uh, the, the topic for this day. So actually, these papers talk about two different things. One is on the smart probes, and I'll be talking to you what I mean by smart probes to diagnose corneal infections. And the second thing is how to use a device to actually rapidly diagnose aspergillus keratitis. Before actually I go into the topic, I want you to see this slide. This is a very, very, in fact, this would maybe the most important slide in my presentation. I'll be coming back to this slide at the end of my presentation, but just register uh, this slide in your mind, and I'll come back to this slide later in my presentation. So I talked about the smart probe and its use in infectious keratitis. The first lesson I learned in research was to go beyond your area of comfort. And it was very difficult uh, for me when, when you have already contributed enough then I was actually scouting for what else can I do in this field of infectious keratitis. And I thought, okay, the cornea gets infected with fungus, the lungs get infected with fungus, why don't we explore working with the pulmonologists? So then I actually ventured out, and then I found out that fluorescence, the whole concept of fluorescence imaging has revolutionized the identification of tubercle bacilli. And we thought, okay, let us see whether that can be applied so that we can use it in ocular microbiology to make life simpler for us ophthalmologists. So we worked with University of Edinburgh. They have an excellent laboratory, nothing to do with ophthalmology. There were no ophthalmologists around there. But then we started working with the pulmonologists there. And we, we did what we uh, proudly refer as cross-learning and what they were actually using it, to be very frank, before I even went to talk with them, when they were saying about probes, I thought they were talking about surgical probes. Then only after I talked with them, I understood what they were meaning was chemical probes, the probes which will go and actually find out the organism for us. So there were actually two, essentially two chemicals, one which is back one, and the other is back two. When you actually mix the back one, 
it goes and identifies gram positive bacteria and fungus in the lungs and gram uh, back two, which will go and identify the gram negative bacteria in the lungs. And what they use is they use a bronchoscope, go and spray this uh, back uh, things into the lungs and directly image. And as you can see, you can directly see the microorganisms from the lungs directly by the clinicians. So I thought maybe this is a technology which is worth exploring. And what we decided initially was, can we apply the same technology for corneal ulcer? Cornea is a much, in a much simpler place than the lungs, not ensconced or not hiding, hiding behind a rib cage. So I thought, let us try this out uh, as a fashion. And we, we published the results of this in American Journal uh, in 2020. And this is actually a very simple step. It just talks about all the, uh, uh, the fluorescence and other things, gives a hype around it. But it's actually a much more simpler thing. No sample fixing is required. No wash steps is required. And then the microorganisms come and talk to you. Here I am. You know, they don't, you don't need to uh, be searching for them. They come out uh, very, very openly. And what we did was in this study, as you know, gram stain is the, is the gold standard. And we compared the sensitivity and specificity, the positive predictive value, and the negative predictive value of gram stain with first was BAC1. I said BAC1 is used for identifying gram positive and fungus. And then as you can see, the negative predictive value, the positive predictive value is much better than, than a gram stain. See for gram negative, it's even better. Gram negative probes are even better so that these actually chemical probes can go and identify and make life easier uh, for us to identify these organisms. So we made, a, we made a statement that smart probes were equivalent or, or better than gram stain at matching gold standard culture results. Now, this is not the end of the story. What we are actually now developing is whether the smart probes can identify the inflammatory markers like IL-17 and C3 and C6 and other activation. And so we'll get a much, much more detailed information than what we are getting now. So this was the publication which uh, we published in 2020 in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. That was the first, talk, uh, first uh, topic which I wanted to highlight today. The second uh, talk which got published in December 2023, uh, uh, around four months back, was again to see whether something simpler can be used to diagnose aspergillus keratitis. The whole thought process is, what if we bypass the whole culture system? See, at this point of time, we have to do a culture to identify whether it is caused by bacteria or fungus. Is there a way where we can bypass the whole culture method and get the finding of the organism in 30 minutes. As you know, a culture of a fungal organism takes four to five days. And for it to speciate, you need a specialized uh, laboratory. Uh, whether we can use an LFD device to, to, to find out whether the organism is caused by aspergillus directly. Because as you know, the MUD study, uh, where I was the PI, very clearly uh, told that different fungi respond to different antifungal drugs. So that's the point to see uh, whether we can bypass the whole thing. So how does this work? So from the corneal ulcer, you can either do a, uh, a swab or a, or, or a scrape and just put it in a, in a, in a, a liquid and then use a reader. And then if you can see the you can see the bl uh, black bands. If you see that band, then it is positive for aspergillus because we are specifically looking for whether it is caused by aspergillus or not. If it is negative, it is not caused by aspergillus. But then you completely bypass the culture mechanism. You don't require a very, very, very sophisticated laboratory, and you don't require a completely dedicated microbiology system. What was what did we do? The, the lung people had already done this, but what did we do is we, under, we uh, identified what is called as a ratio metric analysis tool where we actually quantified it and uh, expressed it in a map to see 
uh, as we can see, the spikes in the positive thing is the equal spike between the control and the positive. So very clearly, it is a positive uh, uh, map. While the second and the third thing, as you can see, second is slightly better than the third, but the third is definitely negative. So that was the whole thing. And then what we said was the sensitivity is definitely equivalent to culture. And by ratio analysis, we are able to say that the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value is much, much, much better. So what it means is it's actually it can detect an organism directly, not going through two steps of smear and culture. And also, because if you can get it diagnosed correctly, then it may help with patient satisfaction and uh, treatment. And also, directly there is an opportunity for taking this, especially when you just require a swab, you can actually take it to the field and keep it at a primary care level. What we are now doing it is, we are now trying to do, we are trying to make separate LFDs. Sep LFDs are there right now only for Aspergillus, but we are designing new LFDs for Fusarium, and also we want to detect, we want to uh, actually design a, a, a comprehensive LS, a LFD which can identify all organisms, and at one shot we may probably know whether it's caused by Fusarium or Aspergillus. So this was the publication uh, which we, we published last year in JAMA Ophthalmology, and uh, this is the rapid point of care identification of Aspergillus species. So what do we know? Where are we now with regard to uh, ocular microbiology and corneal infection? We all know that as clinicians, it is almost impossible to identify whether the ulcer is caused by bacteria or fungus when the ulcer is in an advanced condition. In the earlier condition, you can definitely do it, but in an advanced condition, it is, it is by chance. So we also know that qualified ophthalmic microbiology personnel are not enough in our country, and dedicated ocular microbiology, and then there's a lot of difference if you just use a systemic microbiology lab and an ocular microbiology lab. So dedicated ocular microbiology labs are also very few. This is what we know. And how do we get information as of now? As of now, in the good microbiology labs, even when you have dedicated ocular microbiology facility, you get this is the uh, finding you get from an ulcer uh, of this kind. But what we are envisaging, we have repurposed actually a technique which does not require a seasoned ocular microbiologist. We also do not, we also have now repurposed a technique which was used in the field of pulmonology which can bypass the culture technique and its associated requirements. And we believe that in the near future, this is the sort of report we are going to get when we are going to get a, 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 a microbiology report. Not only we will have an information about the infecting organism, but we will also know that there is a heightened IL-17 activity, there is a high IL, uh, increased uh, C3 activity, there is also an increased MMP5 activity. Now we are completely starting a new uh, era in the way how we uh, will be able to uh, give information to the clinician. This is something like a topography. Before the topography came into place, what we actually knew was whether the cornea was steeper or flatter. That was the only thing which we were interested. And the only slit lamp and the uh, keratometer were the only things which were giving us that kind of a report. But now, with the advent of topography, we are able to get so much of information from the same cornea. So is there a way to have this? And we believe the smart probes, which can identify the uh, microorganisms, if you design it well, it can also be able to identify the inflammatory markers. And our uh, colleagues in the pulmonology where whom I have worked, They've also found out that topical metallo matrix metalloproteinase inhibitors can be applied to the lung. And they did not actually proceed with that because topically you cannot apply in the lung, but we also know that topically you can apply in the cornea. So there is a, there is a possibility that we will be using a lot of inflammatory, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs along with the anti-infective drugs when we actually uh, treat corneal ulcers. I come back 
to this original slide, which I said is the most important of my slide. So previously, when you did not know cooking, you were at a loss. Previously, either you have to take your mother or your wife wherever you had to go. Whether you like them or not, you had to be dependent on them. Now you don't. Now you have so much of choices. You don't, you don't need to know cooking, but you have all the dishes on your table. Zomato brings it to you. Amazon, take Amazon. Amazon doesn't have a shop by itself. But then there is an agency which will be able to get what you want in your hand. So that we want to actually push the whole thing, the power to the ophthalmologist to completely bypass the laboratory techniques, how Amazon did it, how Uber did it, how Zomato did it. That's what we want to replicate uh, in this whole uh, exercise. So I want to end by once again reminding Dr. Rao, he might have forgotten, 25 years back when we were in Chicago in an American Academy meeting, we were in a Jackson lecture together. And when we came out of that lecture, Dr. Rao remarked, how I wish that Indian ophthalmologists come and deliver named lectures like this in an international forum. Sir, the day is not far off. I just want to uh, reassure you that whatever you said on those days is still ringing very, very deeply in our minds. And those kind of inspirational talks uh, or inspirations which you have uh, given to us will hopefully stand good in the future days to come. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Prashna, sir. Uh, now it's my uh, privilege to introduce the NAIC Endo Endowment Award that is in the name of Dr. Daljit Singh, sir. Dr. Daljit Singh, sir, was born on 11th October 1934 as an Indian ophthalmologist, he was an honorary surgeon of Gyan Gyani Jail Singh, then the President of India. In May 1964, he returned to Amritsar as a senior lecturer in ophthalmology. He later transferred to Government Medical College, Patiala, for five years, where he served the Government of Medical College, served as a member of faculty to, of the Government Medical Colleges in Amritsar and Patiala <coughs> for 23 years, and became an emeritus professor to these institutions. He did pioneering work in lens implant beginning in 1976 and the Fugger technique that is the plasma scalpel for glaucoma and cataract surgeries. He was an innovator with transciliary fil filtration which was invented in 2001 and the pre tangential micro tract filtration. He was the discoverer of lymphatics in eye. So everyone knows about Dr. Daljit Singh sir and it's my proud privilege to bestow this particular honor to uh, Professor Dr. T. P. Lane, sir. Professor Dr. T. P. Lane, sir, is a Padma Shri awardee in 2008. He is right now the medical director of Raghunath Netrala after serving medical colleges for so many years and uh, as retiring as a director of medical education research from Mumbai. He is right now a medical director at Raghunath Netrala. And I request uh, Lane, sir, to deliver his endowment lecture on the name of Dr. Daljit Singh. And the lecture title is My Second Birth and rural work in ophthalmology. Lahane sir, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone from AIOS. Thank you very much. Uh, all the dignitaries on the dais, all the dignitaries of the dais, and uh, I really uh, thanks to all AIOS for uh, bestowing upon me such a very big honor and on the name of very big person. So Daljit Singh, sir, was very, very big honor for me. And uh, I think I bow my head in front of him and, and I start my lecture. See, you know about sir already uh, Prashant has told about the uh, Daljit Singh sir. He was Pad Padma Sri awardee in 87, and after seven years, he got the B.C. Rai Award from the Medical Council of India. Now the, this is me. 
my weight that time was 39 kg and my both kidneys was failed and for this i came to mumbai the dialysis was not there uh, in ambijogai and i was getting uh, my dialysis every thursday uh, i will do dialysis and then i was running the department i was head of the department of grant medical college mumbai now this is my mother anjana bai her age is today she is 90 she donated me kidney and what is the thing is that the one similarity that first birth was from this mother only and second birth was from this mother only and when she was taken to the hospital theater the doctor sibber asked her that we are removing your kidney she told me i don't know your language but give me anesthesia and when i am in anesthesia remove my one kidney give it to my son and if that kidney is not working give my other kidney and that is what she said and i changed totally from the can say the uh, can say my attitude was changed and i thought this is my second birth and here i should do something for the people my father is not there but he was used to very happy whenever i am i was doing the social work for the people he just he was no more the at 39 i was taught by abhay masawda and dr k k mehta peko multiplication at the age of 39 i learned this peko and then i joined jj hospital where the department was from 1845 and the it was very old uh, i think the there was uh, nothing so many problems in the department and so then i started doing my work and then the you can see the first is i started the work how i was working for near about you can say 10 to 12 hours every day and on saturday and sunday i was going to the rural maharashtra and i was conducting the camps on my holidays second and fourth i was going and the team then the team came in the picture and this was the ragini who joined and after, after that this nine people joined me and then the this is the team of 42 people they like my family today also they are with me and we are doing great work this is the ragini who joined me and uh, that was the big support because if i am operating uh, 100 surgeries she will also operate 100 surgeries then there are now 10 peko emulsion machines in jj and the results you will see we are operating only 600 cases and now we are operating 60 16000 cataract cases in same jj hospital now started camp it was just a picnic we started we, we were going for the 50 cases and then picnic then we will play there gradually then in 3 december the first camp for bunny and then the there were so many problems on the road and then the uh, it was just because i was a farmer poor farmer i was a laborer so i thought that afiki has created all over and to reduce that afiki i started the camps small incision surgery with implantation of the lens i started in maharashtra first time and then the the basically we were there to recover the patients and also give the spectacle after the surgery so that was this and camp today also our dates six camps dates are decided so that 26 december will be uh, november will be an anand one means we will be an anand one it means all the dates are decided we have never called the patient patient comes to our camp that is what is our strategy there now this is what we prepare you can see everything is like and we, we take it from the flight so wrapped and everything is taken there to the camp truck load and this is the anand one we go there first we screen the patients every patient is screened by me dr ragini and the uh, people there doctor see this is the rush in the opd rush in the opd is near about you can say 15000 cases and we start in the morning at 6 we finish at 12 so that is what in the opd you can see each and every patient is seen properly investigated and treated controlling the crowd is difficult so i always say that if you are not sitting properly then i will go out and then they will sit so like this is what 
the patients are every patient is registered and the batch is given to them and then they are transported to the uh, hospital and in the room so they are admitted so then every patient is systematically examined and then the chemistry a scan is done and every patient the breakfast lunch and dinner is served also the tea and then the can say the it continues the opd basically we separate it male and female separately opd is so huge that uh, it is very difficult near about you can say the forty doctors are there and see this is a 1 km line was there outside and inside there were near about 12000 people this is pathardi in near the nagar it is so so many patients are there and you will see this in the morning we have started in the evening also the same rush is there from morning to evening and then we examine the patients these are the all leprosy patients there in anandwan each and every patient is examined few patients we go home because they can't walk and examine examine them in their house then the we do the ophthalmoscopy direct each and every patient indirect and direct both and then the ot list up every day do we operate near about 350 cases every day but we prepare the ot list sequence of the patient right or left eye also and then we start the uh, operations and then the patients are transferred by bus for the ot and the then we uh, start the work cleaning then the can say the even we wash their you can say the foods and everything kids we wash then they are sitting in the line everybody is in the line and then ot preparation we operate anesthesia and then the uh, each patient is operated registration is made and once it is surgery is done patient is taken to the then after that the post operative instructions are very important we instruct them each and every patient and uh, the this is the patient then they go home so the gift of vision then they go home the follow up after 7 days we go to see the patient and near about 95% patient turn there because we say that we will give you spectacle if you come on the 7th day and we give the medicine on 7th day spectacle for those people on 7th day those who are not coming we say that we are not going to give a spectacle so these are poor people so they come for the spectacle <coughs> and then the every patient is provided with identity card and you can see now these are the uh, male patients opd continues uh, this is the patients in the opd very long hours of the opd such type of patient they come to us bilaterally blind leprosy patients they come to us so we bring them from their place and then this is post operative instructions we instruct each and every patient and tell them about the taking care in their language and also we give them the in the writing also the this is operation theater this is the every patients lens record every patients every record is there since beginning till date so we have got 450000 surgery each patient's record is with us till date and which lens is implanted sticker of the lens is one is the patient and one is with us in the registry since beginning this is the team you can see the we have got different teams it is not one person works so examination team admission team fitting patients we have to fit in the room then the food team the volunteers then the uh, the patients providing they will have to provide the patient to us in the operation theater then the injection team and the dilatation team it means we have got separate team and in that team they work uh, in what is there so everything is happens because of this team and this team works day and night we start at 6 finish at 2 am it means near about we work for more than 18 to 20 hours in the camp and that is also 11 days or more than that and we go for the second dressing every day every time the we always properly we give the paper on which the instructions are written on their language whatever the language is in that language we write this is the post operative instructions i eat, i do some examples i give them so how how they 
uh, mess the problems. So, and because what has happened because of their mess. So I give them the examples and accordingly the uh, patients, they understand. And this is what the patients, you will see they are clapping. The operated patients, these are the operated patients which are clapping with the black goggles and then they are going home happily. You can see the happiness on the face. And this is the one of the strong support, Dr. Ragini, and see the uh, operates near about 120 cases in 12 hours and 75 PECOs in 12 hours. And same I can also operate. And because of that, we can complete uh, those cases. This is what we did, 573 rural camps. It means there is not a single district in Maharashtra or Taluka where we have not gone. Also in Madhya Pradesh, also in Gujarat. We have, uh, we have seen 47 th uh, lakhs patient in camp and operated 1,14,000 cases in the camp. And 121 pickup camps and uh, 4,56,000 cases, uh, 55,000 people were examined, 21,000 surgery was done. And totally 694 camps till date and the 52 lakhs patients were treated and 1,35,000 cases were operated. This is about the camp, not about the, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, not about this, uh, um, and this is the Baba Amte. He inspired us, and because of him, we, we were doing so much of the social work. Then I got the Padma Sri, Honorable Lata Mangeshkar gave us 1.75 crore from her MP fund for this camp. So the, this is the excellence. It is just because of the, we can say, never an accident but it is a hard work, hard work, and hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yavas. Thank you, Lani, sir, uh, for giving a nice talk of this endowment lecture. So it's my proud privilege to announce the end, uh, next endowment award the Dr. P. Nam Perumal Swami Endowment Award. I feel proud and privileged because I did my fellowship from Arvin, and Sir has always been a mentor. So Dr. P. Nam Perumal Swami is one of the founding member of the Arvin IK system and is currently its chairman emeritus and professor of ophthalmology. He started his career at Government Rajaji Hospital in Madurai. He started vitreoretinal surgery center at Government Rajaji Hospital in Madurai, first of its kind in India, and then retinovitreal clinic at Arvind Dai Hospital in 1979. Dr. Nam Prabhu Swami established Center of Relevance and Excellence in Diabetic Retinopathy in association with Government of India, World Diabetes Foundation, Denmark, and Topcon. He has received Padma Shri Award by the Government of India, Lifetime Achievement Award by All India Ophthalmological Society, and Tamil Nadu Ophthalmological Association. In 2010, Time Magazine listed him as one, of the mo as one among the 100 most influential people in the world. So I feel proud and privileged to be his student and be on this platform to introduce Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, for the Dr. P. Number One Swami Award. Can I have the next slide, please? Audio visual, the slides are not moving. Yeah. So it's my proud privilege to introduce our uh, mentor, the guidance given by Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, to all of us in AIOS. So Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, is the immediate past president of AIOS in 2022-23. He was the Secretary General. He is the Secretary General of South Asian Academy of Ophthalmology. He is Director of Vitretina Services at Center for Sight, New Delhi. He did his MBBS and MD from Ames, New Delhi, Vitretina Fellowship at LSU, USA. He spent 21 years at Dr. RP Center, Ames, from 1983 to 2003. He authored the book, A Manual of Fluorescent Angiography, plus a book on intraventral injections. He's got to his credits CME series of AIOS on endophthalmitis and uveitis. He has written 41 chapters in the book, and we all have the privilege to work under his guidance in the All India Ophthalmological Society. He has this dedicated his n number of times and minutes and hours to this society. So I welcome Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, to give his endowment lecture, the AIS Dr. P. Namparvan Swami Endowment Lecture 2024 with the lecture titled Vitoretinal Interface Disorders. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Amit, uh, for this uh, intro. It's really an honor and privilege to stand before this uh, august body 
and deliver uh, this uh, endowment lecture in the name of someone who is a doyen, who is a legend. Nam, as we know him popularly called Nam, has uh, innumerable uh, contributions in the field of uh, retina. In fact, uh, retina in India would not have been the same has had not uh, Nam and uh, Dr. Badrinath and uh, Ian Nathpal, they would have contributed the same way. So I call him as a living legend. As I said, uh, Nam is a doyen in India and abroad. He is uh, one person who is magnanimous uh, in uh, giving. He is a man of uh, masses. One phone call, I think, uh, once I rang him up, uh, an immediate response came uh, that he will be there. His academic achievements, awards, uh, are, uh, are beyond uh, the comprehension of uh, anybody. Chairman Emeritus of uh, Arvind Iker System, uh, the most uh, well-structured uh, system, featured in uh, Time magazine also. Besides all this, he is an excellent human being. And I'm very proud uh, to be standing here and delivering an endowment lecture in his name. So topic I have chosen is uh, interface disorders, which is very, very close to my heart and also very commonly uh, uh, seen by all the ophthalmologists and frequently misdiagnosed, mistreated also. So I begin with this slide, uh, this OCT, which uh, all ophthalmologists uh, do nowadays and uh, all these 10 layers, which is also known as optical biopsy of the retina. On OCT, you can, you know, uh, classify pathologies into various categories, inner retina and outer retina. Inner is from ILM, which is here, to ELM, which is here. Outer retina is from ELM to RPE. But I am focusing today on only one aspect, that is interface pathologies, where the vitreous meets the retina. You see, we are all born with 100% gel vitreous. Gel vitreous is the consistency of an white of an egg. And this vitreous is optically clear. And it has attachments uh, of various uh, adhesions in different people. What happens with age and uh, disease, trauma and diabetes? Two things occur. One is vitreous gets liquefied. Second is the adhesion between the vitreous and retina weakens with time. If this both the processes, that is liquefaction and adhesion, occur completely, we have a total PVD. And uh, that is the time when uh, you have flashes or protests may occur. And that is also the time when horseshoe tear formation may occur. But if the liquefaction occurs, but adhesion is still there, this allows this liquid vitreous to seep in the retro hyalurid space, and this initiates a PVD. And this is a stimulus for cells to proliferate, and this can be accelerated by breakdown of blood retinal barrier, by trauma, diabetes, so many things. It is this anomalous PVD, which is not a complete PVD, which is uh, uh, which is uh, which is the backbone of all these interface disorders which are enumerated here, whether it be VMT, hole formation, epidural membrane. So this is one classification which was uh, given a long time back, but even Gas, uh, you know, when OCT was not there, he had uh, similarly given this classification: VMA, VMT, and various hole formation and lamellar macular hole and pseudo holes. The thing to be noticed here is, uh, you know, in this classification, there are small, medium, and large. Definition means 250 micron 400. But uh, believe me, in our clinical practice, we get X, X, extra large or X, XXL kind of macular holes, which are 1,000 and 2,000 microns uh, in diameter. So uh, VMA is one pathology. I don't know whether it's a pathology or not, but it's a, it's a normal kind of finding where vitreous uh, remains adherent in a broad dumbbell shape. But it is not pulling the retina. Since there is no pull on the retina, there are no symptoms. VMT, in contrast, is a disease where there is a pull. If you see these pictures here, there is a pull. If there is a pull, then the photoreceptors may get uh, distorted, and you may have metamorphopsia. And if it lingers on for some time, you may have macular edema and decreased vision. The key question which uh, all of us uh, 
face every day, do all this VMT require intervention? The answer is a very big no. Because a lot of these patients of VMT have tolerable kind of metamorphopsia or often on metamorphopsia. And sometimes complete PVD may also occur. I'll just show you two examples of each. This is one lady which you operated long time back, fortunate to have good vision recovery in a macular hole. Left eye, there's no symptom at all, but you see the OCT, it's a alarming OCT. So this patient got scared and said, Dr. Sub, OCT, there is a pull. But believe me, all OCT diagnosed uh, VMTs, we don't operate at all. This is another patient whom we were preparing because this patient had progressed from February 16 to June 16. Her, his meta, this uh, pull increased. Patient started complaining of troublesome metamorphopsia, but in between, this membrane spontaneously got separated, hyaluronic, BCV returned to 6 by 6 and N6. So there could be spontaneous res resolution of VMT also. So management of VMT uh, is only if it is symptomatic. Symptomatic also, patient should be troubled by metamorphopsia in his day-to-day -day life and virtually begging for surgery that Dr. Sabai, we can't carry day-to-day -day work. Or other indications could be uh, decreased uh, vision or systolic macular edema. Remember, we don't take, uh, treat the OCT. We treat uh, a human eye, which is, which is uh, having some issues. And basic aim in this management is to get rid of uh, this uh, greenish uh, pseudocular membrane, which is the hyaluronic, which is the pulling the macula. And all of us, uh, vitreous surgeons, are experienced with doing MIVS surgery. And the success rate of MIVS is more than 90-95%. In came this injection, uh, you know, more than a decade back, uh, thinking that they will take away the bread and butter of a vitreous surgeon, which is ocleoplasma and jetria. Jetria came with a big bang, but disappeared also with a very big bang. Not only it was expensive, but the success rates for dismissal to 27% only. And there was this important study which compared uh, jetria versus vitrectomy. Success rate with jetria 50% and with vitrectomy nearly 100%. So as of today, I think most of us are doing MIVS uh, for this VMT. And it's a relatively smaller surgery, it does not take more than 10, 15 minutes. Uh, PVD induction is the key step. You see, once we do a core vitrectomy, we inject these tricot uh, crystals. These get adsorbed onto the vitreous. And classically, two foci will form, one over the disc and one over the macula. And gradually, you increase the suction with the help of uh, this cutter. And always keeping an eye onto the retina that you do not cause any iatrogenesis. So this is, results are pretty rewarding. This is one patient pre and post. Foveal contour may take months and months to come, but the metamorphopsia goes away uh, within a couple of days or weeks. This is the second video showing similar thing, but here what point to be noticed is this patient had a huge tenting of the macula. So here we have to be careful that you do not cause uh, too much pull on the, on the macula, lest you induce a iatrogenic macular hole. The only difference between the previous video and this video is here it's a foveal sparing kind of uh, PVD and we leave this small whitish stump here. Do not pull this otherwise you can cause a in macular hole. So this is the result of this patient where foveal sparing uh, uh, PVD has been done. Result is pretty good. Some fluid but patient is very happy because metamorphopsia has gone. This is another patient who had had uh, similar uh, uh, foveal sparing uh, PVD induction. The next membrane which bothers us is in this interval disorder is epiretal membrane. Epi means upon epiretal membrane. These three membranes uh, we, uh, you know, deal day in and day out. Uh, one is the hyaluronic, which I just uh, described. Second is epiretal membrane. Third is this macular hole where the culprit is ILM. Here again, all ERMs don't require surgery. This patient has 6 by 6 vision, so does not uh, require any invasive kind of procedures. Here again, you see MIVS is the treatment of choice and again does not take much time. It's a very, very rewarding surgery. After you have dealt with the hyaluronic phase, I normally would stain this membrane with Trepan Blue because Trepan Blue is very selective for uh, epithelial membranes. 
and the key step is to identify the edge. And once the edge is identified, then it's a, uh, a very simple job that you either persist with this uh, Ford, uh, Ford, uh, MBR blade or you take with a card forceps and peel it out. This is another patient who has had dry ERMD, uh, MIVS in progress, put tricot to take care of the hyaloid, and once the hyaloid is out, you, under the air, I would inject uh, two or three drops of uh, trypan blue after I made it uh, dry, the posterior pole, with the help of this black flesh needle. One or two drops, wait for a minute or so, and remove this excess dye under the air itself. And once this dye has been removed, you see a nicely stained epithelial membrane hair. And then comes this instrument to create an edge, because this is the critical step is create an edge. And this is a uh, MVR blade, which is an old MVR blade, because an old MVR blade will have a small bend. And this acts like a micro pick. And then you uh, take this membrane out in a single uh, sheet. And after that, uh, normally we don't inject gas also. We just do an airflow exchange and come out of it. This is the result of this patient. Most of these macular surgeries, if there is if there is a early cataract, we tend to remove at the same sitting because cataract can increase after after this lifting surgery. Role of ILM peel because all of us uh, retina surgeons are ILM addicts. They want to take out ILM in all patients, irrespective. But believe me, in a pure ERM, peeling of ILM is not necessary. We do try to take it out just to have assurance that all membranes in front have been taken out. And it has a theoretical advantage of, uh, you know, decreasing the post-op ERM formation. The third and the last thing which I want to cover is about the hole. The whole surgery has evolved uh, from the day, you know, we were residents uh, to this present stage when virtually all macular holes uh, are, treat are, are at least closable. We can close. This is a diamond-dusted uh, uh, instrument, but uh, as of now, we do a pinch and peel technique. And this surgery shows how ILM peeling is done, where the ILM, after being, uh, you know, uh, plane is created, you take it across the macular hole. And in the first sitting, we try to peel uh, this ILM as wide as possible. A couple of hemorrhages uh, may occur, but that do not affect. This is the post-op result. And believe me, this result is obtainable in a lot of patients of macular hole, provided the provided the height is more and the base is less. Another patient showing type 1 kind of closure uh, in a macular hole. A lot of things have happened uh, uh, in macular hole surgery, the choice of tamponade, the duration of tamponade. Nowadays, in fact, OCT has made us wiser that uh, positioning is hardly required. You see one day position or even, even in an obese lady, you know, you just tilting of the head for a day or so uh, does the job. And a lot of uh, other materials uh, like ILM transplant, retinal transplant, or, or lens tissue remnants are also being used. I'll just skip this video because it does not have much. So game changer for me was 2016 when I uh, attended this ASR conference when we learned about uh, uh, the, the ILM flap procedure. And this was my f first flap patient uh, after I come back, came back from the conference. This lady was under my follow-up uh, for more than 10 years, she had a large hole, 1,400 microns. I offered her this surgery. And the difference between the peel and the flap is that you, you don't take it across the macular hole. You just leave this flap at the edge of the macular hole. And you go across and across. There are various uh, modifications. Then some people will have a mini, mini flap, or some people will have a only temporal flap. But this is the. Uh, flap uh, which have been created and after that the rest of the ILM can be uh, peeled away and at the end uh, at the lowest possible suction and the maximum possible cut rate you trim this flap and then uh, you inject gas inside. This was the result you see 1407 uh, and this was the closure I achieved and since that day onwards I have uh, you know uh, shifted to flap making surgery in macular hole. Uh, in a lot of these patients of chronic macular hole or very large macular hole. So world is totally divided between peelers and non-peelers, and the indications of flap surgery primarily are XX kind of macular hole, 
लार्ज मेकल होल क्रॉनिक मेकल होल और री ओपन मेकल होल और मायोपिक मेकल होल सो दिस इज जस्ट अ पिक्टोरियल डेमोस्ट्रेशन दैट एज द हाइट डिक्रीजेज द बेसल डायमीटर ऑफ द मेकल होल इंक्रीजेज सो दीज पेशेंट्स वेयर द बेसल डायमीटर इज मोर देन द हाइट आई थिंक दे आर द राइट कैंडिडेट्स फॉर फॉर फ्लैप सर्जरी other things uh, like retinal transplant or ilm transplant also can be tried in these patients so this is that uh, close classification wherein uh, you know people actually have now said x extra large extra extra large and giant kind of macular holes uh, uh, and these uh, xl and xsl they respond more to this new techniques of flap or also hum uh, human amniotic membrane and auto low septal transplantation so thus to conclude uh, uh, this vr interface disorder is a pretty common kind of disorders often misdiagnosed or missed you know, unless you do an oct and oct and this newer theory of anomalous pvd helps in better understanding of the interface disorders and jetry as i said uh, has is uh, has gone into oblivion as far as i am concerned and uh, the world as i said is divided in peelers and non peelers as of today nobody should be refused the surgery in a macular hole uh, uh, whether the vision improves or not at least anatomically we can close and functional results also are pretty good in more than 80% of these patients and the staining agents actually have added specificity because the visualization actually improves with this thing thank you very much for your kind attention and thank you scientific committee and aios for this honor Thank you, Lalitha Master. So it's my proud privilege now to talk about the next AIS Endowment Award, the AIS Dr. L. P. Agarwal Endowment Award. Dr. Professor Lalit Prakash Agarwal drafted the National Program for Prevention of Visual Impairment and Control of Blindness, now called National Program for Control of Blindness in India in 1976, first of its kind in the world. He founded Dr. Rajendra Prasad Center for Ophthalmic Services Sciences, the Apex Government. Ophthalmological Center of India. His contributions to modern Indian ophthalmology were so profound that we may not be mistaken by calling him the father of modern Indian ophthalmology. So this award, the AIS Dr. L. P. Agarwal Endowment Lecture 2024, is awarded to Professor Dr. Mahipal S. Sajdev. He is the Chairman and Medical Director of Center for Sight, a renowned ophthalmic surgeon recognized for his expertise in area of cataract, refractive, and corneal surgery. both national and international he is honored with the padma shri award on january 26 2007 he was the president of all india ophthalmological society in 2020 i welcome dr mahipal sir to please give his ais dr lp agarwal endowment lecture 2024 with the lecture title evolution of cataract surgery over to you sir thank you thank you very much uh, in the first instance i'll wish to thank the all india ophthalmological society the scientific uh, committee of aios uh, for uh, conferring on me the professor dr lp agarwal oration award as uh, has been pointed out by amit uh, uh, we are uh, products of uh, rp center all india institute of medical sciences and he was the founder chief he only conceptualized the super specialization within ophthalmology and we when we joined as residents way back in 1982 there were already 12 super specializations uh, in ophthalmology within rp center and it was a 300 bedded hospital and uh, today maybe those 300 beds were not what one looks at but it was one of its kind that was there uh an institute academician and a teacher rose to become the dean and director of all india institute of medical sciences but he is the person who had the vision and the leadership qualities uh to think of putting india on the global map for ophthalmology obviously we had a large uh backlog of uh, cataract blindness and blindness in india the first survey was uh, done 
uh, by the Ministry of Health along with RP Center and uh, he was the person who planned the National Program for Control of Blindness. It was part of the 20-point program uh, of the then Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Uh, he has written several books, a prolific writer, but has been an inspiration to most of us, a strict disciplinarian and who would come at 8 in the morning and would be there right till the evening, somebody who has established super specialization in Indian ophthalmology. Uh, bow down to him for his contributions to Indian ophthalmology. Well, friends, uh, something close to my heart, uh, what we have seen evolve uh, from uh, the early days is cataract surgery. Cataract surgery, even today, uh, India has the largest number of cataract blind. Uh, we have uh, great, I would say that Indian ophthalmology has done the maximum number of uh, cataract surgeries in the minimum number of time with the best uh, example, uh, best results. Uh, I have two doins uh, here from Chitrakoot and uh, Prajna from Arvind Madurai who have really uh, excelled in giving quality care uh, at the minimalistic prices but with exceptional results. And cataract surgery has been close to my heart apart from refractive surgery. Obviously, I was a cornea surgeon, but I, apart from keratoconus, I don't do much now. But what is important is that one needs to study the past if you want to define the future because you have to see the roots from where you went, from where you were and where you are today. So uh, cataract has been described way back in 2250 uh, BC. Uh, that is the first time in Babylon, ancient Babylon, that the uh, that the cataract was referred to. Uh, eye diseases and treatment uh, have also been recorded in by the ancient Egyptians. But in ancient India, there is a full chapter on eyes, uh, which is the Uttara uh, Tantra, written by the uh, old people uh, who were there, Samhita, and this is 500 BC. Looking at ancient Greek, then 300 BC, then ancient Rome's. So this has always been a mystery, but obviously the life expectancy was not that high. So maybe cataract was uh, an uh, issue, but the issue has kept on increasing as we have gone. But when you look at the Renaissance and you look at the direct ophthalmoscope that came in, this is where uh, the ophthalmology actually came forward. Now, <coughs> in the history, the 5th century BC uh, couching was what was described. I have never seen a couching of a cataract being done, but I had to look from the Google and try to get out a video, and I'll just show you. It looks pretty, uh, I, well, you can say for yourself, whatever it is, but at that particular time, it was uh, like a curtain that was there, and you needed to uh, get it out. Then came uh, the extracapsular cataract surgery, then intracapsular cataract surgery, like 67. A very dangerous technique was uh, uh, was brought in by Kelman, which had significant number of people who were detractors. But then you can see that how this uh, uh, this uh, dangerous technique has evolved today and has become the gold standard. So that is how things evolve. And then you had the micro incision cataract surgery. Uh, this is the first, as I told you, 2250 Babylon. If a, physician operated on a man with a severe wound. That's what uh, we picked up from Google or makes a severe wound upon a man with a bronze lancet and saved the man's life. Or he opens an abscess. Cataract at that particular time was considered to be an abscess within the eye. So you open up the abscess, uh, let it drain, and then that is what it was. So that person was given uh, award uh, of silver shekels, and that is what it is. Now, this is how uh, couching has been. You can pick up these pictures. This is the earliest form of cataract surgery introduced in about 206 BC. This is, again, this is shushut. These are the instruments. You can see that they pretty much resemble, even if you look here, this looks pretty much like the diamond knife that we use nowadays. <coughs> And these are the lancets, and then you could see that these are the kind of instruments that you had in Shushutra's time. So this is what I picked up. Uh, this is uh, Hans Koch, and this is how uh, the couching was done. So you can see there, this is a needle. Uh, what we do nowadays, go into the pars plana, and similarly, this is uh, how uh, one is going, and you just displaced or dislocated the lens into the vitreous. And that is uh, what uh, the uh, couching was. And then if the uh, zonules were uh, strong enough, then you had to actually go all around it 
and then make it displayed. So this was an art at this particular time and this is maybe a present day or few years ago and this is somewhere in Africa. I have never seen this, maybe any one of you might have seen it and this is, you can see actually a couching procedure which is being done and uh, you can see the ecstasy and the happiness of this uh, old gentleman to be able to count fingers again after a hypermature cataract. So this is where we have, we were and this is how we have evolved. So you need to be uh, mindful of where we have gone. Then in 19, uh, 1747 we looked at ECC. Uh, uh, again, uh, he proved uh, Jacques Deviel in 1747 in uh, Paris. He proved that this is not something which is related. It is basically an opacification of the crystalline, which is length. Uh, and this again, you can see, is the instruments which were used by Deviel for the technique of cataract extraction, which was there. Then came in from ECC because it used to cause a lot of inflammatory reaction at that particular time. There wasn't adequate cortical cleanup, there wasn't a microscope, etc., etc. And then came on the ICC. And for 100 years, ICC was the method of choice that was there. I still remember when the cryo came to RP Center first, it was a revolution. And we were supposed to show a cataract surgery when we were doing our post-graduation examination and I knew that we, we, we would operate without gloves at that particular time and my fingers stuck onto the cryo in front of the examiner. <laughs> and I was in extreme pain but you still had to do it. So this is basically uh, where we have moved. You needed a large enough incision in this. Uh, and uh, often what happened was that, that is why they said that motia pak jaye, so you had to wait for the cataract to mature, then the zonules became weak. Uh, but if you had uh, the problem of the, so these were pre-pressed sutures, you can see you would dry the, uh, the lens and then you would have a cryoprobe, you let it uh, uh, put there and then along with the, uh, the lens coming out, you all at, uh, in a significant maybe 10, 15 percent of the cases, specifically in immature cataracts, you would have the undesirable uh, vitreous that would come out. So this is from where we went on. Uh, this is way back. I, uh, Dr. Ramanji, this was my senior resident. This is me and this is what we used to do uh, in the camp surgeries. Uh, bare hands, I told you, no gloves. Uh, owning a Binamag at that particular time was a royalty. And I still remember my friend, uh, father, uh, Professor Munis Raza got me this Binamag from Japan, Shin Nippon. I think it cost me 2,000 rupees at that particular time. And uh, this was uh, a rarity that you had at that time. So this is from where we have evolved uh, from doing camp surgeries with intracapsular, go after four weeks, do suture removal and give everybody a plus 10 glass. And that would uh, take care of the, this uh, blindness process that was there. Then on came the modern cataract surgery, as I would say, which Charles Kilman introduced the method of paco emulsification. I still remember even in India when we were few people who introduced paco emulsification, there was a lot of criticism because the machines were poorer, the fluidic control was not there, corneas were getting bad, wound burns, etc., etc., there, which was there. And similarly, uh, simultaneously at that particular time, a second thing was happening in cataract surgery and that was the artificial lens that was being developed. Again, it was an intern who told Sir Harold Ridley that you have taken out the lens, why have you not replaced it by another lens? And uh, then uh, he saw a perspex glass uh, from a wi uh, windshield of a pilot having been sitting into the eye of a war, war hero that he felt that he could do that. Obviously, his lens power calculation was not there and the patient ended up with a huge refractive surprise. But then that started the whole thing. So this was Sir Harold Ridley, late Sir Harold Ridley, who implanted in 1950. And this is uh, the second part. Uh, one is the way the cataract is removed and now we have the third part which uh, Ramdev ji is talking about, Drishti that you have the drishti eye drops or whatever, uh, but there is a lot of research that is going on that we may not be able to need refractive, uh, cataract surgery because we will have some eye drops uh, which could take care of uh, the aging process and not have a cataract. So IOL designs have gone on and they have uh, uh, really uh, improved uh, from time and uh, anterior chamber, iris clip, then you went to posterior chamber, C loop, J loop. Uh, we have seen the entire evolution of what it is uh, and the plate haptic C loop modified, etc. Every doctor had a new 
design of IUL and he named it uh, after that. We have seen glass IULs of Momose from Japan who was very popular here and these are the various materials that have but I would say that my intersecting path in cataract surgery was basically when I went to Georgetown University, 89-90. Well, this has got nothing to do with the cataract surgery, but this is the first prototype of the confocal microscope that we worked on, 89-90 uh, and dry eye. Mybography at that time, which today is being done left, right, and center, was developed the infrared mybography at that particular time. Stepped out of my comfort zone, I would say, and went on to do uh, FACO emulsification, which I still feel is the gold standard uh, for uh, cataract surgery and uh, have helped pro propagate uh, this modern surgery, live surgeries around the world. Uh, today, uh, yes, uh, I uh, have to accept that I don't know the procedure called as SICS because SICS came after FACO emulsification because FACO emulsification was the procedure and for reasons uh, uh, of uh, expense, etc., and machine not being available, uh, small incision, SICS came, but uh, for us, irrespective of the grade of cataract, you can see a normal cataract and you can see a rock hard cataract where we are all, you can see, we can split it and uh, this is uh, the FACO emulsification, which I feel is uh, the fluidic balance, etc., has and from a power based the first machine of FACO emulsification that we used could not do a vacuum more than 100 millimeters of mercury. That was universal one. The maximum vacuum that you could do, and we used to do zero flow, zero vacuum for the trenching. So that's uh, something very different from what it was. But uh, no matter what the grade is, we look at it as what it is. And as FACO was a big jump, I would say we were uh, not afraid to, uh, and uh, from FACO, we went on to the femto laser assisted cataract surgery. Yes, again, I would say price is a barrier, but if price does, goes away, this is something which is uh, artificial intelligence is coming in now as to how much the nucleotomy has to be done, the incisions, etc., that needs to be done, cyclotorsion rotation, compensation, toric marking, capsular marking, uh, getting a good part on the uh, on the, this is a posterior polar cataract, you can visualize the posterior polar cataract, you can get the nucleotomy done above that uh, so that you don't have any problem of uh, loss. Uh, this is uh, great, getting a great uh, uh, nuclear disassembly in patients of uh, rock hard cataracts. Uh, you can see that air bubble coming and you can see the color of the nucleus, this is black cataract and you can go ahead and uh, help with the femto. This is again, you can see uh, when you look at uh, here the image, you have a subluxated cataract in this particular case. Uh, obviously in cataract surgery, you had a problem. You are just aligning the posterior and the interior capsule. You can do customization of the capsulotomy. You can increase the size because later once you put this, uh, you can see here, this is uh, a subluxation. There is vitreous. Uh, helping the posterior segment coming in, you are doing a vitrectomy uh, tricot. Uh, you are just uh, removing the vitreous uh, so that the capsulotomy has been done with the femto laser despite vitreous, uh, putting an endocapsular ring in this particular case. And once you have an endocapsular ring which is there, uh, you do an irrigation aspiration in this case. So you are combining posterior segment vitrectomy. Uh, decompression, I would say, putting in a three-piece lens, getting excellent results in the such cases. Uh, today, I would say, uh, uh, for me, femtocatract, 80 to 90 percent of my patients go in for femtocatract, and uh, we are uh, really uh, uh, believing in this technology that is there. So, I would say, uh, in my lifetime, which uh, starting ophthalmology, January of 1982, uh, to where we are today, we have come a long way. Uh, obviously, I didn't see couching, uh, nor did I do couching, but intracap was my first surgery. Within three months of my residency starting, intracap, extracap, FACO, FLAX, and uh, that is where we are. And apart from that, the IULs, as I told you, have adapted today. Uh, any patient above one diopter of astigmatism, you can actually look for uh, true hematropia and LRI is there, or you can do a toric lens and you are getting good uh, uh, press biopia correcting lenses. And I feel tomorrow press biopia will be a thing of the past. Press biopic lens exchange, as things improve, is going to be the future which is there. So this is uh, where we are moving. 
uh, from a restorative surgery, it has become a refractive surgery, and that is the fineness of the surgery and the cataract procedure that we have, uh, which has evolved over time to give perfect vision to humanity and to get them out of the curse of blindness. So thank you very much, uh, friends, for that. I think uh, cataract surgery, like any other good thing uh, that you do in life, is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And you have to constantly uh, keep on evolving and keep on adding new to the armamentarium. Thank you very much uh, for your kind this thing. And William Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his type plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. Thank you very much once again for your kind Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahipal. Uh, now it's time to uh, introduce you with the next endowment award, and that is Dr. S. S. Badrinath. Dr. Sengamedu Srinivas Badrinath is the Indian founder and chairman emeritus of Shankara Nitrale Chennai, one of the largest, India's largest charitable eye hospital. He was elected fellow of National Academy of Medical Sciences. He received Padma Bhushan, which is the third highest civilian award in the Republic of India in 1996. He has also received many other awards to name a few, Padma Shri and Dr. B.C. Rao Award. And more importantly, he, he, he was a guru of ours when we, he was trained by us. So it's a privilege to introduce this particular endowment award. And it's a privilege to invite uh, Dr. Oh, sorry. Guru Prasad Aichit, who is a senior uh, most veterinary surgeon of North Karnataka with a 39 years experience. He is a head of video retinal services at M.M. Joshi Eye Institute, Hubli. His area of interest is medical and surgical retina, uvia, and combined surgeries, and he has performed more than 20,000 video retinal surgeries. 336 presentations at state, national, and international meetings, 24 publications in national and international peer reviewed journal, and he has been an invited faculty for all, almost all the state conferences within and outside Karnataka. So, Welcome, Dr. Uh, Guru Prasad Aichit, and congratulations for uh, getting this in endowment award. And his lecture title is The Art and Science of Clinical Acumen Building During VR Fellowship. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Prashant, for that very kind introduction. It's indeed a great honor for me to be uh, giving this lecture in the name of uh, my mentor, Dr. S. Ispadi Nasser. Clinician, surgeon, mentor, guru, visionary, ophthalmic leader, legend. He was known by many names. Our chief, Dr. S.S. Padinath, Padma Bhushan, Dr. S.S. Padinath, we fondly remember him today because whatever we are today is because of him. He has crafted each one of us into someone who can be worthy of service to humanity. Indeed, the saying goes, that wherever there is excellence, there is a chip of Shankar Netralia. We are indeed proud SNites. SN and Badrinath sir ignited the candle in us with his spark. I am a proud student of Shankar Netralia, which has one of the best structured fellowship programs in the country today. Also made us worthy of training others, which we have been doing by following his footsteps. I thank the Scientific Committee of AOS for honoring me with this huge honor, this prestigious endowment lecture, in the name of the legendary Doyen, internationally renowned Dr. S. S. Badinath, sir. I dedicate this honor to him. Most of what I'm going to say today is about my role as a teacher and how I am trying to carry on his legacy. Just a brief background. There are 751 medical colleges, 66 standalone PG institutes recognized by the NMC, but there is lack of uniformity in the standard of training and standard of exit exams. Most students need the additional basic training, and that is what is what we call fellowship. So my talk is how do I conduct my fellowship program? Before that, a brief introduction about Vitoritna Fellowship and its uniqueness. 
It is not taught like other specialities in residency and usually needs to be taught from basics during fellowship. Most of the students say that I know nothing about retina, fellow, fellow, retina and therefore I want to do retina fellowship. Uh, the first, I want every student to be a comprehensive ophthalmologist first and then a specialist. This is what I tell all my fellows. You have to be a good pan ophthalmologist, a good uh, comprehensive ophthalmologist before you become a specialist. So they have to relearn refraction, basic examination skills, slit lamp examination methods, sublimation tonometry, gonioscopy, and so on. It needs weeks of practice to master basic examination techniques like indirect ophthalmoscopy and 90-day examination. And the findings in the vitreous and retina are so subtle, similar, and diverse that it takes long to familiarize even with the common uh, findings. So uh, hard exudates and rusen at different levels the hard exudates of diabetic retinopathy, the hard exudates of choroidal disease may, may seem similar to the novice and it takes nearly three months to familiarize. So also the level of hemorrhages in the fundus, they are unable to find out or know at what level the hemorrhage is. And therefore in the first month of fellowship, I usually put them in front of the camera, to ask them to take pictures and get familiar with the findings and signs. The safety margin for certain steps of surgery is so little that it is very difficult for letting them lose to do the surgery themselves, lest they cause these hydrogenic breaks. And the diagnostic and surgical equipment are prohibitively expensive, and that is what makes vitoretina a, a niche field. A good cataract surgeon can mature into a good, a good surgeon in any specialty. That is what I feel, and therefore I, I encourage them to do cataract surgery. Dissection and suturing is, some, is something that is forgotten nowadays. We are all into, into modern sutureless surgery. And therefore, it is very important that we relearn uh, dissection and, and uh, suturing. And therefore, I, I involve them in, in cataract surgeries as well. A 100 plus score of SICS, especially SICS if not FACO, is desirable before entering a VR fellowship. Mass work in a medical college hospital is in one way amazing. It's really amazing how they can handle so much of work. It's, and this versus the style of working of private institutes offering fellowships like uh, SN and Arvind and others and um, LVP and ours and Shankara. Uh, most fellows are in for a cultural shock because of this disparity. Every institute has, has its own SOP and it is the fellow who has to adapt and adopt the various nuances of the of the center i hope i have time i just started <laughs> so it's important that they get adjusted and i usually give them enough time for them to adjust and adapt one thing that i learned in shankar netralaya is the the discipline that they have that they, they practice in making drawings and this i i like to enforce on my students as well making detailed drawings. By learning drawings, they do, they learn IDO, they learn color coding, they understand the inverted image, they realize the importance of drawing for pneumatic retinopexy and still buckling, which requires very accurate drawings, and draw a plan for the patient and cross-check with seniors. I think this is one thing that I still practice after 37 years after fellowship. <coughs> Orthodox methods are best, I always, tell my students, especially the DNB students, that every case should be examined as if it is an exam case, like taking the uh, history methodically and examining the patient methodically, coming to a provisional diagnosis, coming to uh, discussing the differential diagnosis, and finally making the uh, final diagnosis. So I also tell them that they should be good technicians first. They have to learn to capture the image, just not read the image, just not read the B-scan, but do it themselves, because B-scan is a kinetic test. and then. The acquisition protocols and the uh, analysis protocols of FFA, uh, I'm sorry, of, of OCT, they have to know it themselves, and this is best done by doing it themselves. So they have to do the test themselves. They have to get used, or they have to know how to use the equipment. And this is done uh, best by guidance uh, from an imaging expert. Teaching in the OPD, point out every mistake, small or big, in the workup. Call to show a typical clinical uh, symptom or sign, for example, this post-fever uh, post retinitis. There should be uniformity in documentation, especially drawings and labeling. Literature search whenever there is a rare case. For example, this is the case of 
uh, astrocytic hematoma of the optic disc of the optic nerve head, and uh, this is what will make them good in clinics. Why this, uh, uh, if I ask them why is this patient's vision poor, please find out. The first thing that a VR fellow does is to put on the indirect often scope and see the fundus. So I, I emphasize the importance of torch light examination and slit lamp examination because these things can be missed. A trap, bleb, uh, a buckle, an infected buckle for that matter. This uh, patient on the left looks totally normal, whereas actually he has an infected buckle and this can be missed on slit lamp examination if it is not done properly. This patient is actually not improving after good cataract surgery because of this coronal opacity and therefore a careful slit lamp examination is, is, is very, very important in uh, uh, preventing ordering of uh, endless unnecessary expensive tests. The no cost and most useful test in ophthalmology is, is RAPD and I think there is no excuse for not doing this test. Even no RAPD is important to document and it, uh, my, I penalize my fellows for not doing RAP, uh, the test of RAPD. What this one test can settle so many doubts and can avoid many expensive investigations. Another examination or set of examinations that have to become routine in retinal practice is to rule out NVI, which is the harbinger of uh, postic segment disease, and vitreous cells, anterior vitreous cells, which I insist that they should look for. <coughs> A logbook is very important. In fact, I, I, I make it mandatory for them, but unfortunately, thank you. Um, so the chronology of learning, the record of rare cases, reminder of anecdotes, and uh, it adds weight to the CV when they apply for a job after the fellowship. It definitely adds to their CV. So this is very important. And um, so learning injections, usually after three months, I allow them to do the injections. The A, B, C, D, E, F of injections, A for asepsis, B for betadine, C for concentration of the drug, D for distance from the limbus and direction of the needle, E for the exercise of finger counting is something that I insist on, uh, is something that I teach them as an acronym to, to learn the uh, injections. Learning lasers after three to four months, I think this is the, one of the best cases to learn lasers because they cannot do anything to the fovea. An inadvertent foveal burn is not possible in these such patients and these are the right patients to start off and uh, better done under this guidance of a senior. So this is how laser is being taught. In the second year, they are, they are given a little authority, freedom and independent responsibility. They are posted in the periphery, in secondary centers, which many institutes have. They are involved, they involve in discussions with the consultants. In fact, consultants start taking opinions from them and encourage seniors to teach juniors. They should engage in video editing. This is very important because it gives a sense of involvement in the surgery and better understanding of the surgical steps. So whenever there is time, Chief used to say, Dr. Badrinath sir used to say, if you are free, don't waste time. Go to the theater. If there's something going on, please observe. So this is something that I always tell my DNB students that they have to come and see the th some, if something is going on in the theater to uh, learn more and more. This is no time to be wasted, at least during the first year when they are free. <coughs> I'm sorry. So they are encouraged to ask silly questions, however silly it might be, not to be stuck with the basic doubts because it is very difficult to unlearn wrong concepts. They should build concepts around the right evidence and I always give them an assignment every day, read this and come, read MacTell and come, read PCV and come, so that they engage themselves in some homework and come back next day to tell me about something. By assisting surgery, they get involved. They, uh, they, are, they are told to see both through the microscope and outside it. A good assistant only can be a good surgeon is what I believe in. Hands-on surgery is something that they enjoy the most. It gives them the kick. It gives them the maximum satisfaction. And knowing the machines is also very important. Uh, Professor Badrinath used to say, Muthu knows better than you. Muthu was one of the OT assistants, and he used to scold us if he didn't know about the foot pedal. 
He used to scold us saying, Muthu, Muthu was an uh, uh, um, uh, OT assistant, a very popular one. He knew everything. He knew he used to guide uh, juniors and uh, fellows. And he, uh, Dr. Badinath used to say, go and learn from Muthu. So this is what we should. And in fact, we should volunteer. The students should volunteer to help set up the equipment uh, along with the technician. Surgery, uh, just briefly I will tell about surgery. OTA ticket is something that one has to learn and it has to be taught very meticulously. Asepsis is something that they should never forget. They have to learn surgery in a phased manner, peritomy, rectal tagging. Getting started with SP, they can start with localization of breaks. <coughs> Trocar cannula insertion, checking the infusion for a clean pass and core vitrectomy in pseudophagics. PVD induction gives the first big kick. I think this is something which everyone will, will agree, all the juniors will agree that when they do the PVD induction for the first time, it, they really feel ecstatic. The students are really very happy and that is what I think, uh, if you want to please a student or get some work done from him, you should give him a PVD induction to do. Steps in the second year or uh, uh, later half of the, of the fellowship is like ILM peeling and all that. I think this, is, this only requires definite, it does not require much of uh, knowledge or uh, skill. It, it requires skill but not knowledge. So this is something that can, we can give in the second year. And complex four-port bimanual surgery towards the completion time. So by the time they're completing, say, by the time it is two years or two and a half years, it is, that, that is the time when you can give them com complex surgeries like this. Community work must be mandatory. It's an opportunity to exercise skills, both clinical and surgical. They are given independent charge, which adds to the confidence because of the volumes that they come across, the number of surgeries which helps them achieve perfection, and they understand the ground reality of the poor socioeconomic uh, section of society and develop compassion and empathy. There's no end point for learning VR surgery, but 50 to 60 independent surgeries, I think, along with 10 complex surgeries in two years is something that will give them confidence. This is my, say, uh, the benchmark. First and foremost, they should really love the speciality. One can't flog an unwilling horse, we all know that, but good mentors can make them all, make them fall in love. So he empowered us with the three hands. Badina sir, the legend, empowered us with the three hands, three H's, hands, head and heart. His powerful teachings have made sure that we pass on his legacy. He believed that a candle loses nothing when it lights another. Thank you very much for your kind, patient listening. And I thank the All India Orthodox Society for this huge honor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for that wonderful uh, lecture and all the endowment awardees are going to receive their uh, endowment awards in the inaugural function today. Thank you so much.